Welcome, everybody. This is the first part in a three-part series where we're going to talk about fresh property tests of concrete. These are tests that you run on concrete before it's hardened to make sure the concrete that they delivered or brought you or made is exactly what you want. These are very, very important tests. So let's get started. In previous videos, I've tried to explain how challenging it is to produce high quality concrete consistently. And I said that we need tools to help us make sure that the concrete that we make or deliver is exactly the concrete that we want. And one of the best ways to do this is to use some kind of consistency test to check a property that we care about. These fresh property tests, the tests I'm gonna talk about today, are great because they are run on concrete before it's hardened. This is great because we can make changes to it to adjust it or get it in the exact way that we want it. The problem with these tests is that they don't always tell you exactly what the problem is. It's kind of hard sometimes. That means it's a little challenging to fix. But that's okay. At least they tell you that something's different. And these tests are awesome because they're fast and they give us important information that's helpful. The first test I'm going to talk about today is a slump test. This test was developed in the 1910s to measure the consistency of concrete. Now, back then, concrete was pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And the real way to change how flowable it was, was the amount of water. And the more water you add, the more flowable, which that makes it easier to work with, but that makes the quality go down. It makes the durability and the strength decrease. So the slump test back then was a great way to determine if someone added too much water or not, or at least if they were giving you a consistent amount of water in their mixtures. Today, concretes are very, very different. They're way complicated. They have lots of different admixtures and tools that can make them do all kinds of great things. So the slump test isn't as useful. Now, it's still pretty useful. It's still the most commonly run fresh property test on concrete, but it's not quite as useful because it just tells us now about the consistency or the workability, and it doesn't always tell us about the durability of the material. So how does it work? Well, we have a cone made out of aluminum. We add concrete to the top of the cone. Then you strike off the surface, and then you pull or raise the cone over a three count. And as it does, the concrete falls out the bottom, or, or actually, the, you, as, you, as you pull the form away, then it's no longer holding it up, and so the concrete starts to move. And it kind of slumps, or falls over into a big puddle or pile. Kind of crazy, huh? Well, then you flip this cone over, you put the rod on top, and then you measure the distance from the rod to the so top surface of the big pile of concrete. Ha! Pretty awesome, huh? Pretty simple. And again, it tells us really useful stuff. The height between the rod and the concrete is known as the slump. And it's usually reported in some kind of length dimension. And higher values mean a higher workability. So if I have a pavement, it usually has a slump between one and three inches. If I have a bridge deck, it's usually got a slump between four and seven. Remember, one and three inches means it didn't fall very far. Four inches to seven inches fell a lot further. Something like flat works, that's like sidewalks or slabs. That's something more like five inches to eight inches. Now, when I say a pavement here, I mean something that's slip form paver. I mean something that's placed with vibration. They wanna be able to place it and pull the forms away instantly and have it hold up on its edge. Slumps are, um, that are very high can also be a, high, a sign of segregation. What do I mean by very high? Well, I mean something around 10 inches or so. And segregation, what's that? Well, that's when the rock separates away from the mortar. We'll talk more about that coming up. But you, you can imagine if there's just a bunch of rocks left, then the slump's going to be really, really high. But the slump can never go higher than um, 12 inches, and really 11 inches is about the maximum, because that's the height of the cone. The slump test is great, because it's fast, it's low tech, it's easy to transport, 
and it still gives you really, really useful information. How, however, there are several improvements that could be made to the slump test. What I mean is that for very, very low slumps, something like about a two inch slump, and very, very high slumps, something about an eight inch, above eight inch, the test is not that sensitive. As in, the test kind of breaks down a little bit and doesn't work as well. Other tests have been developed for concrete in this slump range. For example, there's a test called the box test that we'll talk about coming up. It's actually designed for low slump mixtures that, some, that have to be vibrated, something like a slip form paver. Okay? And if you have something that's very, very high flowability, something that's usually called self-consolidating concrete, this is concrete that doesn't really have to be vibrated, doesn't have to do much finishing, it just kind of flows like water, then the slump test isn't the best test. You'd use something instead called the slump flow, or the L-box. And the slump test only really tells you how far the concrete falls under its own self-weight. So while some people have correlated this to something called the static yield strength, which is a really cool rheometer term, or rheology term, okay, but the slump test does not tell you anything about Maybe a lot of the practical things we care about concrete, like how does it finish? Like how can you, how easy is it, is it to make it smooth? How easy is it to drag it? Or how does it respond to vibration? How does it flow down a concrete chute? How does it work in a concrete pump? How does it put pressure on the forms? These are all things that the slump test really just isn't designed to do. It's not its fault. This is complicated stuff. And if you want to test this, you should develop a test that's closer to this, or just look at it in actual practice. But not all slumps are the same, even though they may have the same numerical value. What I mean by this is just because you have three mixes that have a four inch slump, that doesn't mean they have the same workability or the same consistency. What? Yeah. What I mean by that is there's more to it than just the numbers. You have to look with your eyes and see what's going on. And you have to really know what a slump is supposed to look like. And sometimes when you pull a slump and it doesn't look right, you need to know what that means. Let's get into that now. If any of these things happen to you, then the first thing I would do is probably run the slump test again to make sure that you didn't make some kind of mistake if it starts to happen again and again, it's probably a clue there could be something wrong. Well, let's first start out with what's right. Typically in a slump test, it starts out like this, and then once you pull the forms off, it falls down, as in the bottom gets wider, the top falls downward, okay? Looks something like this, and again, this would be the slump or the height that it fell. Sometimes you get something called a shear failure or a sliding plane that happens. So along this plane right here, the slump actually fells and falls next to it. So what I'm showing here is this is the top. This was the top and it fell down and it's right next to where the bottom is. Okay. And if you measured again the height, you might find that it's the same as this. But if it fell like this, that's telling you something very different. That's useful. The shear failure typically happens when there's either a very low paste content or there's too much sand in your concrete mixture. Now let's say this happens to you. When you pull the slump cone, it just crumbles, it just falls down and looks like a big mountain. Now this typically happens when there's either inadequate sand in the mix and the slump just falls apart. There's just inadequate sand really to give it cohesion to help the slump, uh, the, the concrete kind of hold together. Then there's this case. This is segregation. This is where you pull the slump and the rock kind of stays there and the mortar kind of falls out the side. And it may not fall out one side, it may fall out multiple sides, but the rock just kind of ends up in a big pile. If you measure the top of the rock, it still may be like five inches or something like that. But this is not good. This is not what you want. But again, if you use your eyes and your brain, you can see this and you can know what's happening. And again, this is caused by severe segregation. 
This is usually happens when you have too much of a single aggregate size or maybe a group of aggregate size. And they just don't flow well. They just don't work well together. So what do you do about this? This is kind of interesting because there's not a lot of guidance in the slump test itself to tell you how to judge this. But that's okay. You're smart. You can use your brain and your eyes. You can figure this out for yourself. So I realize this isn't isn't in, in the test method, but this very simple, very easy test can give us all kinds of information if we know what to watch out for. So remember, the more we can measure, the more we can control. And that's really powerful and really helpful. We're trying to control something that's as wild and crazy as concrete. Thanks. Take care.